First up, we'll run through some quick definitions to gain a simple understanding of the term market structure. Then we'll talk about some different types of structures, their characteristics, and some examples of markets with these types of characteristics. Companies want to make profit. This is a simple truth, yet we need to understand that different companies have to make profit in different ways. Some companies produce a lot of products with a small margin and have to be efficient, producing en masse to make their profit. Others can restrict the supply and push prices up in pursuit of profit maximization. Before we get into the different types of market structures, it's important to know about the characteristics we're looking out for. These include the strength of the buyer, the strength of the seller, the degree of collusion, competition, product differentiation, and barriers to entry and exit. The first characteristic we're going to consider is the strength of the buyer. If the buyer is the price maker, as in they can choose the price they want to pay, then they are strong. Generally, when there is a lot of supplies and only a few buyers, the buyer can set the price. Think in terms of the National Health Service in the UK. They are effectively the only buyer for many pharmaceutical drugs and therefore have leverage over the many supplies of drugs, such as painkillers. In this way, the buyer can negotiate the price without sacrificing quality. Next, let's consider the other side of the transaction, supplier strength. If we stick to healthcare and pharmaceuticals, but switch location to the US, there are only a few very large pharmaceutical companies with FDA approval and many healthcare providers, insurers, private hospitals and pharmacies. Therefore, the supplier has more strength and leverage over the price. The supplier is therefore referred to as the price maker, and the buyer is considered the price taker, as in they accept the price as they have limited or no choice. Those following US politics will have heard the term collusion many times since 2016. But what does it actually mean? Effectively in this sense, sellers communicate with each other to an agree an approximate price and avoid competitive prices. In this way, suppliers can set prices at a profit maximizing level without entering into price wars or active competition, which may restrict prices. It's worth noting that collusion is considered illegal and is regulated by the Competitions and Market Authority in the UK, with other bodies existing internationally and within many Western economies. Next, the opposite of suppliers working together is them competing with each other. Suppliers can compete on prices, quality, customer service and convenience, amongst other things. Competition is often beneficial to the consumer as they end up with lower prices, better quality and more convenience. However, it is sometimes great for consumers to allow the supplier more profit in the long run as this allows for research and development, which can increase future efficiency and better products. In some industries, products are pretty similar, known as homogenous. Think about the dairy industry. Milk is milk. You can have low fat, full fat or mixed but there is little to no brand differentiation. On the other hand, some industries may have products or services that are completely different to each other. Markets with heterogeneous product ranges can demand higher prices as they are much more specialized. For example, we can think about car brands. Some cars are more luxurious, faster, or more comfortable than others. Consumers have brand loyalty and choose their cars based on present conditions. For example, a Fiat Punto and a Ferrari 360 are on completely different sides of the spectrum, where the Ferrari can demand higher prices due to product quality, brand image, and desire. The last characteristic we are considering is the barriers to entry and exit, effectively how easy or difficult it is for a new company to enter or leave an industry, due to either natural or artificial issues. If we consider the aircraft manufacturing industry, there are natural barriers to entry, such as sunk costs of the factory, and artificial barriers to entry, such as restricted supply chains created by the companies currently in the market. Barriers to entry and exit can restrict the number of companies in a specific market and discourages new entrants. Now we understand the characteristics, let's look at some structures. Perfect competition is when there are countless buyers and sellers in the market, and there is no control over the price other than by the mass of suppliers and buyers. Let's look at it in terms of the characteristics. First up, suppliers have little or no pricing power and therefore are price takers, but buyers have a little more power as they can easily switch supplier. 
Next, there is little to no collusion, as the market participants are so numerous that it is near impossible to collectivise. Competition is extremely high in terms of price, as if one seller is just slightly more expensive than a competitor, then rational buyers will always purchase the product at a cheaper price. Products are homogenous. They are pretty much exactly the same and can be substituted for each other with little to no issues. And finally, there are no barriers to entry or exit. New entrants can enter and leave the market to ensure that the price and quantity is always at the allocatively efficient point. Let's take an example of a potato farmer. Potatoes are highly homogenous. They're pretty much all the same. In terms of prices, if one farmer makes his prices a lot higher, then competitors will take market share away from them. However, just as an economic model, there are issues. The farmland costs money, and therefore is a huge sunk cost, and a barrier to entry. But if we assume that farms can be rented easily, and there are an availability of skilled farm workers, then the model holds. All suppliers are price takers, as there are many marketplaces to sell the products and many farms producing pretty much the same product. In an oligopoly, there are a small number of firms where none have significant influence by themselves. An example of an oligopoly is wireless carriers, where there are barriers to entry through the costs of expertise and renting infrastructure. However, there is no monopoly as consumers make the choice between suppliers depending on the need, quality of service, and customer service in resolving their issues. In a monopoly, one company will have more than 25% of the market share. In the absence of regulation, one company can gain enough share of the market to control a large portion of it. There can be a few large companies in the market, or even a few smaller businesses surviving, but the majority of control in the market will be between one or a few large businesses. It's the supplier that has a large amount of power in this market and are the price maker, profit maximizing by restricting supply and increasing the price to the level they want. The buyer has less power and is more of a price taker. Infrastructure companies generally have monopoly power in many countries as they require large capital investments and are highly specialized. For example, in the UK, home energy providers have monopoly power due to the infrastructure requirements of installing new pipes. However, this is becoming more competitive with large amounts of capital investment and consumers having the choice between electricity, gas and oil for their home heating. A monopsony market is where there is only one buyer. In this situation, the strength of the buyer is absolute as there are many sellers. It is like a monopoly where there is less balance between the buyer and the seller. A single buyer dominates a monopsonized market, while an individual seller controls a monopolized market. There is no collusion as the buyer cannot collude with itself and the sellers have no pricing power. A great example of this is the pharmaceutical market in the UK, where sellers are restricted to only really selling to the National Health Service, which is total control. Of course, there are exceptions for private hospitals, chemists and shops that sell over-the-counter medication. However, the NHS has a large amount of control over the products it buys, the price it pays and the service they receive. 